First of all, I want to say thank you to Maria for, uh, for organizing the talks at Google and giving us the chance to bring, let's say, this, uh, uh, this story to life. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Link, because actually was the one that said, I want Joy to come and talk at Google. And I'm like, OK, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my job. And I wanna, I'm actually. I want to know why after this minute. <laughs> and, uh, uh, right? <laughs> and I'm like, OK, I'll work on this. Um, I'm actually very excited to have you here, Joy, with, with me and, and with us. So welcome at uh, Google. Thank you. Excited um, to be here. I'm, uh, I'm also a little bit nervous because I've never uh, interviewed anybody, and especially my friends. So imagine. <laughs> so I need to say that I'm, I'm also very honored uh, to have you here and have this chance. So it's a big opportunity, and, uh, uh, and I'm very like, you know, happy to, to have you here with us. Um, who from the audience knows Joy? Raise your hand. OK, beyond the friends. OK, we have some friends and some people obviously like work with him. OK, fine. That's like playing very easy. Uh, sorry? You, you know the restaurant, right? I mean, and you know what was fascinating uh, about that? I was like thinking about like, um, how did I meet Joy? And actually, Joy is like one of the first person that, that one of the people that I met in Dubai. Like, day number one, I met Joy. And then day number two, a friend of mine was like, oh, I need to take you to this beautiful restaurant that just recently opened. And they happen to be the main. So it's kind of like interesting how like my past three and a half years at Google, sorry, at Google and at Google and in Dubai have been linked a lot to like Joe and his restaurants. He opened the the the, the main oyster and bar grill uh, three four, four years ago, and then uh, the beautiful cocktail bar, Barbary, that kept me very busy together, probably like with many familiar faces here every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. Um, and uh, and you and you recently opened up uh, a new main in uh, in Studio City, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess that like many people here are wondering, you know, this is like a a big story of of success, but why are we calling this talk the Legend of the Falls? But before you answer that question, I want you to answer. Speed questions. Okay. Speed. And you were not prepared for this. We start off with speed <laughs> questions. Um, favorite foods? Um, I'm a big sucker for Lebanese tabakh. Okay, so question number two, Lebanese or Italian food? <laughs> definitely Lebanese food. <laughs> favorite Google product? Um, definitely Google Docs, otherwise we, oh, would, we wow. wouldn't be having this. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty advanced. Meat or vegetables? Uh, meat. Sing the song that you sing in the shower. Uh, Creep by Radiohead. Do you want to sing it for us? No. <laughs> <laughs> Restaurant you wish you owned? Uh, internationally or in Dubai? Whatever, just be wild. Um, God, that's, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. OK, no, good. No, that's a big question. Manual free time? Free time. We have a question, but I'm not sure I want to ask that. <laughs> Last Halloween costume. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was actually the last American werewolf in Paris. I was a werewolf. So. Michelin star or mom's recipe? Definitely mom's recipe. I don't buy into the Michelin star thing. Last thing you watched on YouTube? Um, the story of the Central Park Five. Wow. I would expect like, some cats flying or something, but like, <laughs> pretty deep. Good. Thank you, Joy. So, so as, I, as I said, like, you know, it looks like a very successful story. and. We we'll probably want to hear more about this, but can you tell us why we're talking about fo like Legend of the Falls and like why why failing? Yeah, I mean, people you know, uh, people only really ever see the success. I mean, people rarely um, see sort of all the failures that that sort of preceded it. They they rarely uh, I'm rarely invited to speak about you know failure. It's sort of a very vulnerable thing to talk about. Um, I think. People are interested by failure um, as, as a subject, but it's, it's rarely sort of the, the subject that, that is highlighted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that in, in business, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, uh, nobody ever tells you uh, where all the traps are. Uh, you have to definitely fall into them uh, to learn where they are, and it's all sort of part of growing and part of learning and, and, and part of success, I think. Um, but I mean, I think we're always failing, and I think without failure, there's without failure, there's no success, and, and vice versa. I think it's a very uh, kind of symbiotic relationship. So. 
So. Nice. Um, if you if you need to uh, tell us a little bit more about your past and and maybe like digging down a little bit more about these failures and and, and your learnings, like you know, it, it was fascinating to me. Like you know, even like talking to you in the last couple of days, like understanding you a little bit more and. You know, you were telling me, you know, at the 30, uh, uh, when I was like 30 years old, you know, I was like very, kind of like, you know, in a successful company, having like a good job. Yeah. What changed? Why, why did was, you leave that? That was actually the turning point. Um, it was 2008. Um, it was sort of the beginning of the recession in North America. You know, the market was getting a bit shaky. I had just turned 30 years old. Um, I had a very cushy job. I was making a good salary. Um, I had a company car, you know, I was like 28 years old, driving around in a BMW, that was a very big deal. <laughs> uh, you know, I owned a house, um, and, and I was the head of uh, marketing and concept development for a big group in Canada that had 80 restaurants. And I was actually heading up all of their development and marketing for all the restaurants. And uh, we, were, we were opening something like three, four um, restaurants a year at one point. So it was, it was an amazing school. Wow. Um, and I had a, a very uh, good teacher. It was a, uh, a Greek uh, restaurateur who was kind of prolific and, and notorious for being, uh, you know, quite, quite a, a character. Uh, but he was, he was a mentor in many ways, and he sort of taught me a lot of what to do and, and a lot of what not to do. Um, but I, I felt like I was, you know, in, in when I turned 30, I, I felt like I was a bit too comfortable. I didn't feel like I was being challenged. Um, I didn't feel like I had anything left to learn, and I felt that if I didn't start, you know, the uncomfortable process of trying to make it on my own, I'd, I think I never would. So I kind of took the leap. Mm -hmm. uh, around that time, also, my father was um, diagnosed with, with cancer. So in a way, I had to leave. Um, I had to leave Montreal. Uh, and I went to Lebanon and spent a year with him, um, really, in and out of hospitals and, and dealing with that. I'd never lived in Lebanon, so it was kind of a very... But you're Lebanese. I am. I'm originally <laughs> yeah. Lebanese, but I I've forgot. never lived in Lebanon. It was sort of one of those things where, you know, when I was growing up, there was a Lebanese civil war, so it, it just never, we never went. Um, and so when I went to spend time with him, uh, it was really a very, I mean, it was totally new for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the main reason why I decided to go out on my own. Yeah. I mean, I had to, I felt like I owed it to myself to try. I mean, that's, that's actually also like a very, you know, touchy story. I think about like going back and like leaving the comfort of a good job and like going, you know, to, to your home country, which is not really home. And, you know, like right. being close to your father, which I'm sure like he would be very, very proud of you today. Okay. Um, anything maybe you want to tell more about your experience in Beirut? How did you, how did you move like from Canada to Beirut? Like what was your, your, mean, your experience there? Uh, it was, a, <laughs> it was a, First of all, I never expected to move to Beirut. I, I really thought to myself that I was going to go there, um, spend some time with my father. Uh, he, he actually passed away in, um, in 2009. And I think part of my um, grieving process, I think part of my, you know, that, that, that kind of that shock, I think was launching myself into, into projects. Um, I didn't know anything about Lebanon. I, it was a very new market for me. I didn't know anyone. Uh, I, I remember I used to leave the house in the morning without really any idea where I was going, but I really just sort of went into it. I, I met people and, and, you know, I think they were interested in my story and, and my experiences back in Montreal. And I guess my advantage was that coming into Beirut with sort of a fresh pair of eyes, I was able to kind of spot some gaps in the mm -hmm. market there, uh, which I think someone living there wouldn't have seen. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, the first idea that I had was to open up a burger concept. I mean, at the time, it was sort of the beginning of this sort of trend of the gourmet burger shop. And, and I had said, well, let's, let's try this. It was super simple. It was like two burgers and, and a hot dog. And it was... How did that go? Uh, it went very well. I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean they all, you know, it was, it was a resounding success. And, and uh, you know, there was lineups. And it was, it, was, it was really cool. It was sort of the beginning of that burger trend, I think, even in the region. Um, and, and I actually, Beirut, I mean, I had opened... To be fair, I was there for two and a half years. I opened five restaurants in, in two and a half years. So I really, I mean, when I say that I launched myself into it, I really launched myself uh, into it. And they were all very wildly different, and they all did sort of well in their own, uh, in their own way um, and were, were well received. Yeah. Nice. Um, I, I honestly think that, you know, going back to the, the, the concept of failure and how it shaped, you know, the successful entrepreneur that you are today, um, I... I maybe want to ask you 
a tougher question. What was your worst day as an entrepreneur? Um, my worst day. <laughs> I mean, I, there's one, there's one, uh, there's one day that kind of stands out in my mind. I had just opened up a, um, a restaurant in Zaytuni Bay called uh, St. Elmo's. Uh, Zaytuni Bay, for those of you that don't know, was kind of a was kind of like the redevelopment of the of the Bay of, of Beirut. Um, and I had actually taken two locations because I figured, you know, if you're going to open up one restaurant, you might as well open up two. Uh, and so I actually opened up two restaurants within a span of, of a week of each other. And they were very different concepts. One was a kind of a very high-end steakhouse concept and the other one was kind of a more casual uh, seaside brasserie, similar to, to what the main is actually. And, um, and I remember we were the first ones to sign. And I was very happy about the fact that we were actually also the first ones to open. Uh, but what I didn't realize was that, um, you know, I thought we were going to be the first ones to open. We would have time to kind of, you know, adjust and we'd start slowly. And, you know, they call this soft opening in our business. What I didn't realize was the radio was blasting and advertising that, you know, Zaytuni Bay was open, but we were the only restaurant that was open. So I wasn't expecting 5,000 people to come down <laughs> to the opening and we would be the only restaurant that was open. And I remember it was a very, we were really unprepared. Yeah. Um, you know, the team was very new. The kitchen hadn't, it was our first day. Um, you know, I remember at one point I was closing all the doors because I was trying to stop people from coming in. Uh, but people were just like, it was crazy. I mean, they just came in, they sat down. We couldn't tell who had a reservation, who didn't. Um, people would order. I mean, at one point I, st I was standing at the kitchen and I just kept seeing these bills come out of the printer. And there were so many bills that actually formed like a pile on the floor and we were just not able to keep up. And I just thought to myself, this is hell. And I actually had to go, the reason why I'd consider this my worst day is because I had to go around to every single table and tell them that they were never going to eat. Like the food was just, we just couldn't, it, like it was just not going to happen. So that's definitely not the way you open up a restaurant. No. Um, I remember one woman was with her kid and her kid was crying because, you know, they had been stuck in traffic and then they had to find parking and then they had to walk all the way down. There were so many people and they finally found a restaurant, finally found a spot. And all the kid wanted was like French fries or, you know, whatever. And I just... Yeah, that was definitely one of my worst days. I think <laughs> probably the worst day I've ever had. Yeah. That's actually a very interesting Can you imagine story. that? Yeah. Awful. <laughs> it was an awful day, but it was a very awful day. The restaurant awful. ended up doing very well and, uh, you know, had a good run and, and, and people loved it. But that was like the, the first day. And if yeah. you were to give like maybe some of the lessons that you learned, like going through all of these years of experience and all of this, you know, in some, in some ways like failures, like like throughout time, where, where do you feel like you failed the most and, and what, where are your takeaways from the past? I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, you wouldn't know unless you, you actually failed or you wouldn't know where the traps are because there are a lot of traps and you wouldn't know these traps unless you actually took the risk and actually uh, embarked on it, let's say. Um, I think the core of where it all starts is, is, the, is the partnerships, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, you don't do a project in isolation. Like, you need to have partners or, or chances are you need to find investors. So, so partnerships, identifying sort of who are the right partners, what to look out for, red flags, um, how to raise money, how to structure a partnership. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a very important saying, which is good paper makes good friends. You know, having the right paperwork in place. Um, very important. Sounds boring <laughs> as hell, but it's the most important thing because if, it's, if the foundation is wrong, it's just, you cannot imagine how painful it is. Because um, then you, you, know, you have so much love for this thing, for this idea, and y you're, you're dragged down by this, by this bad partnership or whatever the story is. So I think, I think paper is very important. I think surrounding yourselves with the right kind of people I think having a great accountant and a great lawyer, again, sounds very boring, but probably the most important thing, the p most important two people you can ever have with you uh, to look over stuff. Um, so I think that's where, the, that's where most of the problems start, is when you don't know how to, um, to identify the right partners. Uh, I think it's also, um, 
probably key to ask a lot of questions. <clears throat> you know, I don't think you should ever take things for granted. Um, I know, you know, a lot of my decisions are made from intuition, but there's a very big difference between sort of non-negotiable things, things that you absolutely should not let go of, and things that are nice to have. Example? Um, well, I mean, it depends. I mean, for example, it, well, in negotiating partnerships, I mean, uh, the roles and responsibilities, what's within your control yeah. and what's your decision yeah. versus other people's decisions. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the, the thing that you have to understand is when you're talking about partnerships and, and money, money will always try to convince you that money has more value than you do. You know, I mean, you're coming in here with this great idea, with this know-how, with all of the skill that you've built up over all these years, but money will try to convince you that the money is trumps your know-how and your knowledge. So it's important, it's very important that you always negotiate from a position of strength. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes people who want to start businesses have their backs up against the wall and you know they've left their job and they don't have you know an income and, and, and they need this project. So it's crazy how much when you need something you start making a lot of concessions mm. and before you know it you've pretty much given up all of your you know, all of your negotiating power. And honestly, sometimes it's better to walk away from a project because you realize that if you started wrong, it's probably not going to go very well. And at the end of the day, you have to know, I mean, I guess the takeaway here is that you have to know your value. Um, you know, money is sitting in a bank unless they have someone like you to, to make it work. So it's, it's, it's kind of key. <laughs> um, and if you start wrong, you cannot imagine how much it, it unravels and it comes back to haunt you later on. So yeah, that's, I think that's one of the main, the main things. That, that's really fascinating. And, and like, think about like, again, like the conversation that we had the last few days, you said, you know, like from Canada, you went to, you, you went to uh, Beirut and then from Beirut, at the end you said, you know what, well, I wanna, I wanna go and try in, in Dubai. And yeah. And w one of the key points that Joy was, was, was like mentioning to me was like, you know, I really like put everything that was in my pocket, everything that was in my time, everything that I had at that time into one single project. And that was like, yeah. either make it or break it. Yeah. Can, you, can you maybe tell, me, tell us yeah, more I mean, about well, that? Well, first of all, people will probably wonder why, why I left Beirut. I mean, I left Beirut because uh, I had, you know, I didn't choose the right partners. Um, the projects all did very well. I mean, they were very well received. They did very well. Um, Beirut itself is a very difficult market, and because being a Canadian, never, never having lived there. Sorry, I see the Lebanese nodding at this moment, like yes. Yes, they, they're agreeing. <laughs> I mean, I, I see some. I mean, I, it's a very difficult market, and it's really a survivalist mentality. You know, a lot of the people that do business in Beirut grew up during the war. They have a very survivalist mentality. They're survivors. They, they. You know, when things don't go right, they know how to pick themselves up and, and keep going. I mean, they're very strong and very resilient, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was like a Canadian boy, you know, coming into Lebanon, not really knowing anything. And, and, uh, and so Beirut was a very tough, tough uh, experience for me. The partnerships that I had in Beirut, mm. um, compared to the ones I have here, for example, are very different. <clears throat> Dubai is a much more mature and professional uh, investment uh, culture. Uh, you know, uh, when I was talking about knowing your value. Uh, in Dubai, when they invest in you, they, they invest in you as an asset, as a person and as an asset. They're not only investing in the business, they're also investing you as, uh, as, as a person that's make the, gonna make the business run and, and represent the business. Um, in Beirut, on the other hand, it was a little bit kind of, I don't know, a bit more kind of vanity projects, a little bit, a lot more ego. Uh, there was definitely a lot of uh, friction you know, uh, there they're smiling. You see that? <laughs> do you? Are you relating to what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no. It's it's a it's a completely different set of, of uh, values, let's say. And 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 I and I had a hard time adapting with that. I'll be honest. Um, plus, also the political climate didn't help too much. You know, like bombs and kidnappings, and you know, <laughs> it was very hard to do a business plan when like you would have weeks where nobody would step foot in the restaurant because there was some crisis or whatever it is. So coming to Dubai was definitely a much more, um, I mean, I had grown up here, you know, so Dubai is kind of home. And, but at the end of the day, you know, moving here after the experience in Beirut, I, I was feeling, I wasn't feeling super confident. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was a little bit kind of, you know, uh, insecure. And, and I had made a little bit of money in, in, in Beirut, luckily. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, you know how expensive Dubai is. Uh, by the time I'd moved here and got my apartment, which I had to pay up front and set up the company to get myself a visa. And, you know, um, I had found the location for the, for the main and I had to pay the deposit on the space. I had to pay lawyers. I had to pay accountants. Uh, I had to pay architects to start doing the architectural plans. Uh, I had to pay branding people to help me put together sort of the, the, the investment package and all of that. And I had to survive for about a year. Uh, so I'd pretty much blown through my savings within kind of less than a year, I would say. So it was, I think Dubai was kind of my, kind of Dubai was sort of my last gamble mm -hmm. uh, before I was like, okay, forget the Middle East. I'm going back to, I'm going back to Canada. <laughs> um, it, it was a big gamble. Um, Dubai is not an easy place and, and, and anybody, and I have a lot of entrepreneurs asking me about doing business in Dubai and there's a big barrier to entry here. Um, you know, the bankruptcy laws are not particularly, you know, uh, friendly for people starting off. It's a very expensive. Um, you know, back in Canada, if you're a waiter or a, or a chef and, and you sort of pull together a couple of dollars between you and your friends, you're able to open a restaurant. Here, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, it's a little bit more risky. I mean, that's ultimately the, 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 the core of the issue. So you have to be very uh, adept to risk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, it was just, like I said, I mean, I had one card left to play and that was just my big, um, my big gamble. I came here, um, I, I worked with a concept development company for a little while mm -hmm. uh, called Meraki and Modus and they were doing a bunch of projects and, and that sort of gave me an opportunity to kind of see the market um, and sort of spot the gaps, I guess, and think what I would do. And, and the funny thing is, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew exactly what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first saw the location for the main, uh, it, it kind of just hit me. It was just meant to be. Speaking about the main, I want to ask the audience, who, have, uh, who has been to the main? Raise your hands. That's a, that's a good, that's who a hasn't good. Been, who has not been to the main? One person, two that people. Is, that you, is. No, no, no. You guys have free dinner there before you say you anything do, wrong. Actually. You guys have free dinner. I <laughs> didn't um, It's obviously very popular. Like, all of my colleagues have been to your restaurant. That's amazing. I, I, and, and, and I want to connect this with the, with the next question because, like, I was reading like in, in an article, but you were also like trying to explain me like this concept of like pressure points. And, and you, you were talking to me about, you know, having a concept that can scale, but at the same time, providing micro moments to people. So how did you provide micro moments to, 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 to all of us? How did you do that? How do I do that? <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, it's important to understand where the main comes from as a, as a concept. You know, I think at the time, going back to 2000, 14, when I first saw the location, 2013 even, um, Dubai was very much led by these sort of celebrity import restaurants. You know, it was a lot of this sort of, you know, this celebrity chef and that celebrity chef and everything was quite um, expensive. And in this sort of the year that I was here and I was getting invited out to these different birthday parties and whatever, and, and we were sort of a group of 10 and I was, I was getting these, you know, and everybody had to split the bill. And I was like, uh, you know, I had a couple of ceviche plates and I was, and I owed 800 dirhams. Uh, I was like, okay, there's something wrong here. Um, it, at the time, there really wasn't anybody playing in that kind of licensed middle category mm -hmm. of restaurants. So there were a lot of restaurants that were charging sort of 500 dirhams plus, but nobody was sort of playing within that sort of 250 to 350 category. So I knew that I wanted to do that. I wanted to be the kind of the, the brasserie mm -hmm. guy and do that kind of, that kind of an experience. Um, when I got proposed the location uh, for the main, you know, it was a location in the garage for those of you that have been there. And, and actually, it was rejected by six other people. Um, one guy had even paid the deposit, done all the plans, and then he backed out because he really thought it would never work. But when I saw it, um, I fell in love with it because I actually, I actually loved the, um, the cachet of the space. Mm -hmm. um, I loved the idea that you had to go into the garage and all of that. Um, but also, I felt like it was an opportunity to sort of surprise people and delight people and I felt that it was kind of this opportunity to create this very um, cool almost underground yeah. experience mm -hmm. even though I mean it is on the seafront and whatever but 
I felt that it was an opportunity to create this little subculture, if you want, of, of people uh, that if they knew about it, they were like part of some select elite group that knew about this place. And that, and that was sort of my, my original intent, if you will. And then, I mean, I guess, you know, obviously, you know, great food, good value. Um, you know, I think, I think pressure points can be kind of split up between, uh, you know, uh, tactile um, elements, like, you know, just things you touch and feel and smell, like, I don't know, like, um, like the soap in the bathroom and, and the, the, you know, the texture of the paper and, and the plateware and the glassware and that kind of that feeling of, of, um, of drama that comes from filling up this kind of relatively industrial garage space with a lot of uh, luxury and, and, and opulence. And I, I'm very uh, excited by this notion of excess and this, you know, great music. You know, we have an amazing, we have amazing music at the main, um, I call it um, baby, baby making music, you know, like bed, <laughs> bedroom music, this kind of like Motown soul music. Um, you know, lighting goes a long way. I think restaurants in Dubai especially have, uh, you know, they do a terrible job of lighting. I mean, I think in general, like, like you know, people love good lighting. Um, and, and really just a sense of value. And then, then you've got non-tactile things, you know, things like, um, you know, the general mood, like the tone of voice, the personality of the place. And, th and actually, the thing about, about doing restaurants is you, you really, you're really attacking this from so many different angles. Um, it's really a 4D experience. It's, it's so many things um, you cannot imagine. It's very, uh, it's a very, uh, it has to be a very complete yeah. uh, exercise. And, and, and you're mentioning like, you know, how all of these like many elements like come to place and like, you know, you need to kind of have control over everything. If you need to, or if you need to tell us like, I don't know, a percentage or, or you can like share a little bit more about how much time do you spend in the creativity side and, and non-creative part of it? I wish, <laughs> I wish it was more uh, creative. I mean, obviously the creative part of it is the stuff that excites me the most. Um, but actually, it's quite the opposite. I mean, people look at the restaurant business and think it's a very glamorous, you know, woo-woo business. But actually, it's <laughs> kind of the opposite. It's a, it's a business kind of like any other. It's, She's smiling. Yeah, she, she knows. For you, that's yeah, they know. They know. <laughs> it's actually, it's very much a numbers-based business. It's very much a business that's based on, you know, um, uh, systems, procedures, mm -hmm. recipes, mm -hmm. costing. Uh, it, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a heavy a systems oriented not sexy. business. It's not, it doesn't, I know, it's not very sexy. Uh, it's very HR led, it's very, um, you know, processes led. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, and then I think just a very small percentage actually is ideation and, and, and marketing, um, to be honest with you. Uh, during the, the beginning of the project, obviously the pre-opening part, I mean, I get most excited by, by that, by mm. kind of creating that story and choosing all those elements and kind of that's sort of the, the part that I love obviously the most. Um, the key is I, I think going back to the, to, the, uh, to the conversation about where maybe you can fail is when you start, if you're not protecting your vision um, strong enough and if you're letting your partners or your investors or anyone really start kind of giving their input and if you start letting go of certain things that you think are important, you have to really protect your vision and you really have to act as the, as the sort of the custodian of the brand um, and really like hold that to the absolute letter because people will try their damnedest to get you off course. It, it's, it's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, people will just do it, I don't know, it's like sport. Uh, they, you know, they will just do it, especially partners especially investors. So that's another thing about when you're looking for uh, partners, make sure they're silent. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, will, they, will you know, they will have taken a trip to Paris and have seen something that has absolutely nothing, with your, you know, nothing to do with your concept. And they will say, we must do this. Or they have a friend who's coming to visit and he's like, a, he, he's, he has a restaurant business back in Singapore and, and he's gonna come in and and help you out and change everything for you. I mean, there's a lot of this type of stuff. So it's very important that you are, I mean, just 
singular in your, in your, in your vision because you will be taken in every different direction. So strong vision, protection of, of, of that and, and your brand yeah. and like making sure that, you know, there are these pressure points all the time, yeah. you know, under control, kind of like the, the recipe. Um, mm -hmm. one, w one of the questions that I have for you is, how do you make sure that, you know, also like a, uh, um, you know, also like, you know, systems and technology, you know, help you and support you in, uh, in, in providing this very good experience to your, to your customers, I mean, to all of us. <laughs> immensely. I mean, I guess we're at Google, so we have to talk about this, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's huge, and it's, you know, again, I've been doing this for the better part of 20 years. So I'm I've asking this question because they have a very cool answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've, seen, I've, seen, uh, I've seen a change and grow, you know, I mean, again, especially like when you look at online, you know, the online experience, I mean, before it used to be enough that you had great food and great service and, and good good value, but now I mean, it, you know, now the online experience is so important. Like I, I t sometimes I feel more like a uh, a magazine editor than I do uh, than I do a restaurateur. I mean, we're such a content driven business, and we're always driving this kind of impression. I mean, the experience really starts before they even step foot into the restaurant. So how we look online. You know how we're rated, how we're what the, what the sort of you know the, the reservations experience is like, how they find us, uh, our SEO, all of that is very very important. Um, you know we live in an age that's not only very content driven, and, and we have to almost have almost a very editorial um, work. Work. Yeah. I mean it's it's hugely editorial, and I mean we work with a great agency, a, a great group of uh, of people called Slate, uh, who help us do that, and, and they produce all of our sort of our. our really high quality stuff campaigns how about data and how do you use data and like you know the input from from i mean data is, is hugely important because you know it's sort of this reviews yeah i mean we live in an age of instant feedback definitely i mean i think this is sort of the uh it's a double-edged sword right i mean you want to know what people think uh but sometimes it's you know when i get that message on my phone in the middle of the night that it's trip advisor or whatever i i do kind of my my stomach you know my heart does sink into my stomach um we, we, we've spent a lot of time looking at it, mm -hmm. and we've actually noticed that the majority of, uh, of negative reviews, I'd say almost 90% of negative reviews, usually come from people that have, um, that have never been to your restaurant before. You know, so it's, they'd heard about it, they'd heard all this amazing stuff, and they've been excited to try it, so their expectations were very high, and then they came, and then for whatever reason, their expectation was not met. Right? That's usually, that's, that's mostly the kind of negative reviews uh, that you get. Uh, and then you also get, for some weird reason, you get negative reviews from, from, um, from single diners, you know, people who come in by themselves. I don't know, I guess they have, because they have time. You know, they're by themselves, <laughs> they don't have anyone to talk to, so they're, they're there, like, basically, on Zomato, so or TripAdvisor, or Google. Well, actually, the, so the key is, so there are ways to, to sort of, you know, circumvent this, and, and, and we have this policy in the restaurant where we we ask them during the reservation process, you know, is it your first time? Mm -hmm. If they didn't show up on our database, let's say. Um, and, uh, and, and then we, we, we make a note of that. We tag it that way. And then we, 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 we make a kind of a deliberate effort to just overdo it, you know, just go to that table, spend time with them, go to that, that guy who's sitting alone by, at the bar and really, like, you know, befriend him. Because, I mean, again, he could also be... You know, uh, you know, tomorrow's party of uh, five or six mm -hmm. or whatever, and that's usually the case. Um, so, I mean, the database and the reservation systems are really kind of the heart of it all. Uh, and if that's not properly sort of optimized and 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 uh, and and mined, and if it's not properly interfaced with all of our, you know, our POS and all this other stuff, then then you're not really um, <coughs> allowing technology to help you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we're quite good at that. I mean, I think. I think at the end of the day, it's one of these very, um, it's, it's one of these challenges that we have. Definitely, we, you know, technology we use a lot in terms of improving always our internal processes. You know, getting everything online and, and get everybody, you know, sh sharing information. I mean, I think that's definitely the key of it all. Uh, we have this very famous line in our company, which is um, uh, systems run restaurants and then people run systems. People do not run restaurants. You know, our systems are what run our restaurants. Um, it can't be dependent on any one person. So that's sort of the non-sexy part yeah. of it. it th that's exactly right. But you're, you're thinking about like all of the sexy parts. Yeah, but I mean, it's important. You have to know, right? So it's just, yeah. 
Uh, I, I can go ahead like for like another half an hour asking you questions because I find it's like interesting. The more I hear the story, the more like I find it very compelling and, and interesting. But I want to maybe ask, who has the first questions here in the audience? I actually have a question. Yes. Oh. Um, thank you for being here in the class and thank you for being part of the thank you. program. Actually, one of my questions is that uh, when you talk about the Chinese language as a language, one day he told me like, let's go for dinner and I told him, let's go to Maine. And he told me, ah, oh, yeah, I like this restaurant. So <laughs> thank you for being here with us, and congrats also for the, thank you. For the restaurant. My question is around competition. There are more yes. than 100 hotels under construction for next year yes. and plans to actually like a growth. Mm -hmm. And all of those hotels will come with new restaurants. So which are the key things to succeed in this business with all of this new competition? I, I don't really think about it that way. So it's hard for me to say. I, I try not to. I mean, first of all, I don't know who these these restaurants are going to service. Um, so that that's that's my first answer. Is I don't know who they're for. Hmm. Um, at the end of the day, Dubai is still quite a small market, um, and and I'm not entirely sure that the the you know filling the the city with 600 more restaurants is is a is a, is a smart strategy. Um, because at the end of the day, you're talking to still a very small market. Um, so I think, again, the keys are that you have to do what you do really well. You have to play to your strengths. Uh, and you have to have a very key um, differentiating factor. So I think that if someone is planning to open here, I think they better have a very key uh, unique selling proposition and be able to stand out in a, in a market, which is not that easy to do. Because I mean, I, I talk about this in terms of noise. I think the market is a very noisy market. Mm -hmm. And you have to work twice as hard to rise up above the noise. Mm -hmm. And then even if you do manage to rise up above the noise, you have to constantly be, be top of mind and reminding people that you're there. Because there are all these openings and, and things. And what gives me, I suppose, a little bit of comfort is that the market is still very developer-led. Dubai is one of those markets where, to your point earlier, it's all these celebrity chef imports. So it's this guy who has money. He brings in this chef from wherever. He attaches this brand name. He brings this branding agency. He brings this architect. And they all do their, their thing. And, and then you end up with this kind of this, this bastard child of a concept that has no father, no, no, um, you know, no ownership. And so what gives me a little bit of, I suppose, um, it fills me with a bit of sadness because I hate people to invest all this time and energy in things that are not going to work. But I think that the only way things can work is if there is an owner operator or a visionary that is holding this whole thing together. Um, and, there, and I guarantee you that out of all these restaurants and all these hotels that are opening, there's maybe less than 5% of them have that, that person. So. That's kind of the, I suppose that's the answer. I, so I, don't, I, don't life, think, I don't think about it. Long life to joy. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I mean, that's, question, that's also not sustainable. Question. But anyway. I'm joking. I'm yeah. We don't want you to yes. go anywhere else. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. One second, shall I wait? Yeah, thanks for being here, Joey. We, we know each other, I think, a little bit over the last two years. And in that time, I have uh, I've followed you a little bit, be that socially or just in person. And increasingly more, I see you in high-end media, if you will, like GQ. I see you as the face of a clothing brand. I now recently saw you on ICE as well. So I see you casting your persona in, uh, in media. <coughs> what part of that supports your business? Um, how much does that help you in your business? I mean, the truth is that at the beginning, I kind of wanted to avoid doing that. I didn't want to make it about me. I wanted the, you know, I wanted the food to speak for itself, and I wanted the restaurant to speak for itself. I didn't want to be, you know, I don't want to put myself in that in that situation. Uh, but, but the truth is, like I said earlier, we are in a very content-driven age, uh, and part of telling a very complete and compelling story is is for there to be that person who's constantly championing uh, the, the, the product. And, and all of these things that you mentioned are just cross promotions and, and ways to, to keep 
to, to stay top of mind. I mean, it's sort of, it's part of it. And it's also part of a brand building exercise for myself. I mean, obviously, um, it's good and it's fun and, you know, you get to wear fabulous clothes and, and all this stuff. And, but uh, it, it is important. I think it's important to do a lot of things. I mean, it's not any one thing. It's kind of like a perfect storm of many, many different things. You have to cast a, a really wide net and kind of attack it from every different angle because because that's what it takes today to, to, to rise up above the noise. So yeah, it's, it's, it's all of that. We have another <coughs> question here and then we'll get. We'll get. Do, do you want to follow up on this? No, 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 no. I, is the microphone even working? I feel like his voice yeah, is it's very. Working and it's working. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. It's actually the microphone is working for the camera. Oh, all right, yeah. well, I got you. I'm like, <laughs> I can hear them fine. <laughs> Hi, Joy. So, obviously, you talked about you know working in a diverse market in different countries, and uh, obviously you talked as well about uh, the importance of choosing your partners, but. Let's say, if, if, what advice do you give to people when someone comes to you and says, should I be an entrepreneur? I like the question. I, I have a lot of people asking me if they should be an entrepreneur. You know, I feel like it's a, I feel like it's almost a very uh, innate thing in everyone. This kind of, this question, everyone asks themselves, like, can, do, can I do that? Do I have what it takes to do that? Um, it's funny, because my father, was an employee his entire life. I mean, there's really not that much entrepreneurialism in my, in my family. Um, so I don't really know where I got it from. I think it's a different answer for different people. I don't discourage people from being entrepreneurs, and I don't encourage people to be entrepreneurs. Um, I can, you know, the truth is, it depends on your appetite for risk. You know, if you have responsibilities, if you have you know, a dependence, if you have, you know, uh, less of an appetite for risk, then I would say, no, d you can't, don't do it. Um, if you are, um, it also depends on the, on the business that you're getting into. It, it depends on, it depends on a lot of different factors. I, there is one thing that I say to anybody who is starting. I mean, in my case, you know, if I think about it in terms of when I, when I decided to be an entrepreneur in 2008, to the time that I said, like, okay, I, I've actu I'm actually comfortable as an entrepreneur. I mean, we're talking six years. Six years of clawing, you know, really, it was a struggle. I mean, no income, no security of any kind, no certainty in any shape or manner. Um, so, and even if you know what you're doing, you know, and you, it still takes you three years at least before you could say that you reach kind of a level of comfort. So I, I definitely tell people to be prepared for that. And look, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we have a, we have a large organization and, and there's a lot of people that, that work with me and have worked with me in the past who have tried to do this. And, and I mean, I encourage anybody to try to do it. But I think the one thing is you have to do it from, you have to be woke, you have to be you have to know what you're getting yourself into. You can't have these delusions that it's going to be smooth sailing from day one. It is just, it's just not. It, it can't be. Um, and, that's, and that's the truth of the matter. So, yeah. So I guess failure is kind of part of it. I, I don't, you know. So I don't tell people yes or no. I, I tell them, I ask a lot of questions. Hi, so Joy. I had another, oh, yeah. okay, sorry. Yeah. I have two quick questions. So yes. the first one, of course, what's your favorite restaurant in Dubai right now, <laughs> apart from Maine? And the second one, in a place like Dubai, so there is new restaurant every time. How do you build loyalty for your customer that they, you know, will come back to your place maybe, you know, more than two times, three, five, ten times? Okay, well, I'll answer the second one first because I hate the first question. <laughs> Everyone, asks me. Everyone asks me that question. Um, I think this, you know, loyalty, you know, I think, I feel like the market's changed. I don't think it's about loyalty anymore. I think it's more about personalization. Um, I think as long as customers feel that you're constantly personalizing uh, the experience to them, I think that is much more important in, in, in fidelity than loyalty. You know, for a long time, the market was led by loyalty programs and, and you know, VIP cards and all of this sort of stuff. And I actually think if a, if a client feels that you're personalizing the experience for them, we, you know, we have this thing in our company where we don't say no. 
uh, we, we really work with the guests to, to make sure that they are sitting where they want to sit. They, they are being served by who they want to be served by. They, you know, uh, they have the feeling of ownership in, in, in the brand. They feel part of the journey and that's sort of also part of the content, you know. Um, so I feel like it's more about that than, than, than loyalty. I mean, loyalty becomes the, the byproduct of, of that personalization. Um, my favorite restaurant right now, I think, is probably um, the one that I, I don't... It's so funny, I don't go to restaurants. Ask, ask him what's his favorite What's your favorite restaurant? Uh, amazing Italian restaurant. <laughs> He's Italian. You know what, I, I enjoy Three Fills. Yep. Um, it's, a, it's a great restaurant that I, that I like. It's sort of a very cute yeah, I love it. little restaurant yeah. that, that uh, is a great experience. Very different. Yeah, very different. Yeah. Tell me. Cool. Um, so Go for th it. Th they're doing like this to me, but we have time for one we'll more do, We'll do one or two more. That's one. it. <laughs> one, two more. Two more, and then I have one final one, Maria. Okay. I have a final But I asked one. already, okay. so I'll give it. Thanks, Joey, for being here. Thank you, Bruno, for making it happen. Uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, the first question is... Che he's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> the maid and Barbary are successful in very different ways. Yes. What are the inspirations that went behind each one of them, yes. if they are different? And then the second question is, you were talking a lot about filling the gap. Yeah. Uh, what is the gap that is remaining? Is there a gap still to be filled in Dubai? And are you, what is the next inspiration for you? And if you're planning on filling that? It's funny because the second question actually answers the first question. I mean, the, the, what makes, uh, well, I think what makes both work is the fact that they do fill a gap in their kind of, in their, in their own way. Uh, the main kind of fills that gap in that kind of licensed mass premium category, you know, that kind of brasserie. And, and, and because it's been so well received, now we are basically the brasserie company of Dubai with you know the Studio City and, and Business Bay opening up before the end of the year. Um, and the funny thing is the main as a concept you know has has legs. It's it's you know when you look at markets like Singapore and Hong Kong and, and even in London, um, there isn't anything that looks and feels like the main. So actually mm -hmm. it, it's it's successful because it, it is able to to move into other markets and we're looking at that. Barbary Barbary I was just kind of like almost like a my own vanity project because I was sick and tired of going out in Dubai. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't. I hated the idea of going to these super pretentious places and getting hit with these bottle prices and 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 all of this sort of door policy and all this nonsense. And I wanted to create a cool, funky, you know, not too big, safe space for people that just want to dance and have a good time, with, who don't want to feel like they they need to dress a certain way or spend a certain amount of money or or you know that that, that they have to be a certain you know whatever. Um, and that was where it came from. And, and I love the idea of doing it in Barsha because Barsha has its own kind of naughty, sort of tawdry reputation in the city. So that's, that's actually where it came from. But I, I think finding the gap and filling the gap is actually sort of the key to, to it all. Um, actually, yeah. Thank you. One more question. Raise your hands who has one more question. <laughs> Give it to Ramos. Sharvin, what's your question? Yeah. Just ask. Have, just ask it. You, you, you Go ahead. Like. You, what's the burning question? So, you know, if you look at many industries, you see that technology. Wait. <laughs> it's a technology <laughs> question. It has to be asked. It's going to be a technology question, so I can save mine. <laughs> just wonder with what we're seeing in other industries and how technology and digitization is getting there and it's impacting user experience. Yeah. But take retail, for example, in general. I wonder what do you see happening in your industry and whether it's going to preserve this old style cachet when you dine in or we're going to see more digitization of the experience? I mean, ultimately, there is going to be digitization. You know, there are, you know, the takeout industry is obviously uh, one perfect example of how um, people are want instant gratification now and they want to have their food delivered to them to their house without leaving the house. And, uh, and I'm having this conversation now with, with Deliveroo about how you can kind of maybe marry both experiences. And I mean, let's be honest, I mean, retail is changing. Uh, I think in the next 10 years, you won't see malls anymore. So there, there, is, there is this sort of haunting question of, of what is the future of, of experience. It's a very good question. I mean, I think in terms of, in terms of 
my experience, uh, I think resources are our biggest challenge. You know, finding the right talent today is, is a huge problem. Um, we just simply can't find the people fast enough. Uh, you know, I, I co-founded a company about five years ago called Hey Hot Staff, um, which is a, an online uh, social recruitment platform. Uh, and actually, the funny thing is when I was looking at it, I was saying to myself, okay, well, has anyone, any, anyone ever really done anything different with recruitment? Uh, in, in our business, really all we're ever looking for is client-facing people, bartenders, waiters, hostesses. Uh, and so we created this, this platform to, um, to essentially uh, eliminate the CV and make it all just sort of visual. Uh, if you have a great personality, um, if you carry yourself well, if you're confident, then we have a job for you. You know, uh, the technical stuff we can teach you. You know, but but ultimately, if you don't have a soul, then then you can't work for us. Uh, uh, hey, Hot Stuff does very well. It's it's we've got I think about forty thousand people on it now, and uh, and about nine hundred companies recruiting through it. And I think it's going to be a bit of a disruptor actually in the in the space. Uh, but in general, I think human capital or, or talent is the biggest challenge because ultimately people no matter how digitized it gets still want to connect with other people so yeah talent is i think talent is the biggest uh the biggest challenge yeah. they're doing this to me like uh, i need to stop one more last question from my side what's what's next for you what's in your future um lots i no, mean I, the main obviously like i said is is uh is growing and, and, and I think will continue to grow. I have a project that I'm kind of working on that is kind of close to my heart mm -hmm. that I would like to do. Which is? Which is, uh, I've always kind of wanted to tackle Lebanese food, um, but it's sort of one of these things that I don't think anyone's really ever done it right. So it's something I've, I've been thinking about a long time. Um, and I suppose my, my big legacy project has always been uh, to, to get into hotels. I think, I think restaurateurs can do hotels well. You know, people like Ian Schrager and, and Andre Balaz and, and Nick Jones from Soho House. I mean, they do, they do hotels very well. But hotel operators don't do restaurants. Very well. so, it's sort of, <laughs> so I think, it's, uh, I think if you could do restaurants, you could do a hotel, but not, not the other way around. So. Thank you, Joy. <laughs>